Welcome to the Endless Knot Podcast. Where the more we know, the more we want to find out. Tracing serendipitous connections through our lives and across disciplines. Hi, I'm Avon. And I'm Mark. Welcome to the Endless Knot. Today we're going to talk about feasts. Yum. <laughs> Before we get to talking about the word feast and the video that we recorded last year for Christmas and for the holiday season, uh, we have a couple of things. The first and most important is to thank two new patrons, H. Johnson and Alyssa Page Renner. Thank you so much for your new pledges. Woohoo! If you'd like to come and join the community and support us over at Patreon, you can go to patreon.com slash the endless knot. And now, of course, we should also, before we get going, talk about our cocktails. It's been a couple of episodes since we've been able to have a cocktail, since we were interviewing, since the last episode was with Scott at Sound EDU. Oh, and of course, we've had the bonus episode with our talks at Thornalaw. Yes. So now we're back to actual just chats and we have a cocktail. And this time, even though we don't really talk about one this in the video per se, it is food related and holiday related. So we are drinking a Christmas cake martini, mm -hmm. which we haven't yet tried. This is recipe that, I mean, martini, it's one of these martinis that's a literally nothing martini. to do with a martini. And I'm making air quotes, which <laughs> really works well in podcasts, yeah, I hear. It's, it's a top podcasting. Yep. Yeah. But this one is built on a whiskey base, a scotch whiskey base, and then has a little bit of cherry brandy or cherry hearing in our case, and lime and orgeat and brandy, or it was supposed to be cognac, but we only have brandy, and then is garnished with cinnamon dusted cherries <laughs> and cinnamon sugar listen i dusted that darn cherry look mm, look yeah, at that yeah, cherry that is a dusty. cinnamon dusted cherry it's very dusty i'm just very proud of myself so why don't we go ahead and try that all right i suppose it's supposed to taste like a christmas cake it's not unlike a christmas cake yeah if your christmas cake is soaked in whiskey which ours certainly could have be. been yep in Certainly the past be. this year i think we used brandy but we've done whiskey in the past mm -hmm. yeah it's got the fruitiness from the the cherry, cherry mm -hmm. and the lemon which is there's usually lemon in mm -hmm. it and the cinnamon i mean you could have a fuller range of christmas cake spices but mm -hmm. cinnamon's not bad i think the the cherry we use to garnish is a little more upscale than the cherries we put in the actual cherries you put in christmas cake <laughs> yeah but you know this is only one cherry to the I, we couldn't possibly afford to fill our Christmas cake with Luxardo cherries. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. It's tasty. Even for someone like me who isn't a big whiskey fan, then there's there's enough other flavors mm -hmm. um, balanced nicely for me. You like it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think I think I quite like that as a Christmassy cocktail. Yeah. All right. Well, I think that's all the business we have to do. So do you want to just tell us about what we're going to listen to? Yes. We're going to start with the word feast, which as we'll discover soon has kind of two meanings. The sort of meaning that probably first pops into your mind is the food meaning, mm -hmm. but of course it can also have always. A, yes. <laughs> always food <laughs> comes into my mind first, but it can also have a, a religious meaning mm -hmm. as in the feast of Stephen. All right. And this is the video that you made last December. That's right. Yeah. Okay. So we will pause now and listen to that. And then we'll come back and fill you in on some more details and then wander down a couple of rabbit holes, I think. Mm -hmm. The word feast didn't originally have anything to do with food. That came later. Feast actually comes from the same root as festival, and is really about religion. And we can still use the word feast in that older sense when we refer to something like the Feast of Stephen, a day in the church calendar for honouring St. Stephen, which you might know about as the day on which good King Wenceslas looked out. This is what's called polysemy, when a word or indeed any sign or symbol has multiple meanings. 
feast and festival came, through Old French, from the Latin word festus, which as an adjective means of holidays, festive, solemn, or merry, and as the noun festum means a holiday, festival, or feast. And from the same root, by the way, we also get words such as fair, festoon, and fiesta. Well, this Latin word can be traced back to the Proto-Indo-European root deis, whose meaning isn't entirely clear but which leads to various religious words, including the Greek word theos, god, which gives us words such as theology, pantheon, and polytheism. The root may ultimately descend from Proto-Indo-European day, to set or put. But the more common modern sense of feast, as a lavish and elaborate banquet, comes from the fact that at many religious festivals you might expect to eat and drink well. The funny thing is, though, the word banquet had kind of the opposite meaning originally. The word comes into English from French, where it was formed as a diminutive of the word banc, meaning bench, and had the earlier sense of a small snack that you would eat on a bench rather than a full meal sitting at a table. Our word bench unsurprisingly is related to this, as is the word bank, in reference to a moneylender's bench or table. All these bench-related words come from the other sense of the word bank, as in a river bank, from the idea of a man-made earthwork for sitting on that resembled a river bank, which by the way is another example of polysemy, bank and bank. All of these words can be traced further back through the Germanic branch to the Proto-Indo-European root beg, to break, because a bank of earth is a feature where the contour of the ground is broken. So the banquet moved from the bench to the table, becoming an elaborate meal, which could have multiple courses. And thus we have the word dessert, because dessert comes from French desservir, literally to unserve, because it involved the removal of what had been served earlier. This is why, by the way, dessert is spelled with two s's, since the prefix is from the Latin prefix dis, lack of, opposite of, or way, as opposed to desert, which is a combination of the prefix de plus the unrelated stem serera to join. Now the stem of dessert comes ultimately from Latin serio, to serve, be enslaved, from the noun servus, slave. And it's important to remember that although we get the words serve and servant from this Latin root, Romans didn't have servants, they had slaves. Now the further etymology of this Latin root is uncertain, with some scholars suggesting that it might be from an unknown Etruscan source, Etruscan being a long extinct and little understood language isolate in pre-Roman Italy. But it's also been suggested that it comes from the Proto-Indo-European root ser, meaning to protect, from the notion that a servus was originally a guard or shepherd, but later developed the pejorative sense of slave. If true, then it would be related to Latin servo to keep preserve, which gives us words such as conserve and preserve, as well as English hero from Greek heros, protector. All this talk of desserts, of course, reminds us of the traditional Christmas pudding, and I should note that in some places, such as Britain, pudding is a general word for dessert. But if we want to move past traditional foods to actual ritual food as part of a feast in the religious sense, perhaps the most obvious place to see this is in the ritual of the Eucharist, a rite practiced in some forms of Christianity in which the priest gives the churchgoers bread and wine as part of the church service. There's that serve root again. The Eucharist represents the body and blood of Christ as a reflection of the Last Supper of Christ with his disciples, before he was betrayed and eventually crucified, when he said, do this in memory of me. And depending on which form of Christianity we're talking about, the bread and wine are thought to actually transform into flesh and blood through the process of transubstantiation, the point being that in some religious festivals and rites, food often plays an important role. Now, since I've been throwing around the words tradition, ritual, and rite, we should probably pause to consider those terms. The word tradition comes from Latin tradere, to give up, hand over, deliver, a compound of trans, across, to the farther side of, and dare, to give. So a tradition is something that is given over from one generation to the next. So many aspects of feasts and festivals, including specific foods, can be traditional, like the Christmas pudding. And what's more, rites and rituals are generally speaking traditional, passed down over generations. The word rite and ritual come from Latin ritus, religious observance, ceremony, which is traceable back to the Proto-Indo-European root re, to reason or count, also the source of words such as reason and arithmetic, and is a variant of the root r, to fit together, also the source of words such as harmony, art, and order. Rites and rituals can be tied to seasonal or cyclical events, like planting and harvesting, or the cycles of the sun and moon, they can be tied to contingent events like marriage, birth, or death, or they may involve initiations or rites of passage. And specifically we can talk about rites of feasting and festivals, which include things such as Christmas and other festivals that take place around midwinter, like winter solstice and new year celebrations. 
Now, anthropologists look a lot at ritual, specifically in the context of religion and myth. Going back to that example of Jesus and the rite of the Eucharist, we can see that the ritual is basically reenacting a story from the Bible, in that case the death and rebirth of Jesus, what's called a dying god pattern found in many religions around the world in which a god dies and is reborn, often allowing for some kind of renewal, and many festivals involve some kind of reenactment of a traditional story or myth. The early mythologist Sir James Fraser, in his landmark book The Golden Bough, saw this kind of ritual reenactment of a dying god myth as representing fertility rites, though it should be noted that Fraser's theories have come under much criticism, mostly due to lack of evidence. Let's look at another example of a ritual that involves feasting, the potlatch, a kind of gift-giving feast practiced by the indigenous peoples of the Pacific Northwest coast of Canada and the US. The word potlatch comes from the Chinook jargon potlatch, to give, or a gift, from the Nootka word pachatl, to give, and depending on which First Nation you look at, the specific details differ, however basically a potlatch could be tied to particular contingent events, like births or weddings, and would involve competitive gift giving in order to enhance one's prestige, and could be a major element of the economic system. Interestingly, the word potlatch may be connected with the word potluck though potluck probably comes from a combination of the words pot and luck, and not the word potlatch itself, it's possible that potlatch influenced the modern sense of potluck, or conversely the modern sense of the word potluck led to the colloquial use of the word potlatch with the same sense. You see, originally potluck referred to an impromptu meal thrown together with whatever was available to feed an unexpected guest, so it was the luck of whatever was in the pot. But now we use the word potluck to refer to a communal meal in which the guests each bring a homemade element of the meal, which is referred to in Alaska as a potlatch. Now sometimes a Christmas party can involve potluck contributions from guests, and so for the purposes of our story today we'll turn to the various midwinter festivals like Christmas and the role feasting plays in them. Midwinter festivals, at least in cultures of the northern hemisphere, are quite common. Christmas itself lies in the centre of a whole season of festivals, some religious and some secular, that is sometimes referred to as Christmastide. In fact, the date of Christmas itself is a kind of uncertain thing, insofar as the celebration of the birth of Jesus is concerned. As we'll see, it probably has little to do with any historical date. There's nothing in the Bible that provides any direct evidence for any sort of date. Early guesses often placed it in the spring, probably for symbolic reasons as a time of birth. The 4th century Roman calligrapher Furius Dionysius Philocalus gives us the earliest mention of the date December 25th, alongside the date of various pre-Christian Roman festivities, so a long time after the events it refers to. All kinds of justifications for this were suggested over the years, such as the belief that the crucifixion took place on March 25th, and since Jesus must have been on earth a perfect number of years, because of course, working in nine months of pregnancy after conception on March 25th gives us December 25th. But the reality is that Pope Julius I just declared it so in the middle of the 4th century, and probably because there were a bunch of other festivals at that time of year in Rome. And why not piggyback on an already successful thing, am I right? This kind of blending of traditions is called syncretism, and we'll be seeing a number of examples of this. Now there are other feast days in Christmas tide, for instance the Feast of Stephen which we mentioned before. Stephen was the very first Christian martyr, with his story being told in the Acts of the Apostles in the New Testament. Basically he got on the bad side of Jewish authorities because of his blasphemous teachings, and was eventually stoned to death, so in Christian art he is often depicted with three stones sitting on him. Interestingly for our purposes, St. Stephen's Day has become associated with a distinctly unchristian ritual, Rende or Hunt the Wren, in various Celtic parts of the British Isles. Basically it involves the ritualized hunting of the wren, later a fake wren on top of a pole, with mummers dressed in straw suits, referred to as straw boys or wren boys, celebrating and singing and collecting money. This is one example of a widespread midwinter tradition of ritualized begging or otherwise earning hospitality at this time of year which survives today in the form of Christmas carolers, and often also involve misrule in the form of disguises and the breaking of traditional societal norms. Mummers, by the way, are revelers who often perform little comic plays, often as street performances or going door to door. One typical plot involves a doctor who has a magic potion capable of reviving a vanquished character. Sir James Fraser, in one of his frequent leaps of imagination, saw this mummers play story as a descendant of pre-Christian fertility rituals. Now at this point you may be asking, why a wren? Well, there's a Christian folktale that God, wanting to find out who was the king of the birds, set up a contest to see which bird could fly highest and furthest. 
It looked like the eagle was about to win, but when the eagle finally started to tire, the treacherous wren, who had been hiding under the eagle's wing somehow, suddenly soared off and won the honour. Now why God would need to run a contest is not really explained, and this may just be a rationalisation and another example of syncretism. Instead, the ritual, though only recorded from the late 17th century, might come from a pre-Christian source. The wren is the smallest bird native to Europe, and killing one was normally held as either wicked or unlucky, so having a day on which you are allowed to hunt wrens is another example of misrule and reversal ritual, and we'll see more of these associated with the midwinter season. What's more, the wren was a symbol of the past year in Celtic mythology, since it would still sing in midwinter, and the old Irish name for the bird means druid bird, so wren day may in fact descend from Samhain or Celtic midwinter animal sacrifice rituals. By the way, Sir James Fraser similarly took this as an example of the sacrifice of an animal normally considered to be sacred at an annual festival. There's also a story told in the Isle of Man in which a beautiful fairy lures men to their drowning in a river, who when challenged by the people transforms into a wren and escapes, as well as stories about wrens betraying Irish soldiers who are fighting against Viking invaders by tapping on their shields, and similarly betraying the martyr Saint Stephen we started with. But getting back to examples of syncretism, perhaps the most famous connection between Christmas and a pagan festival is with the Roman festival of Saturnalia. There is no shortage of YouTube videos, podcasts, and blog posts about the relationship between Saturnalia and Christmas, so I won't repeat all that, but for our purposes in looking at the relationship between feasts, festivals, and food, there are a few things worth pointing out. So Saturnalia was celebrated on December 17th and later ran through to the 23rd, thus spanning the winter solstice. It was preceded by the month-long Brumalia Winter Slash Harvest Festival, which takes its name from Latin brevis, short, in reference to the gradual shortening of days leading up to the solstice. Saturnalia was held in honour of the Roman agricultural god Saturn, and was heavily influenced by the Greek festival Cronia and the god Cronus, also a god of agriculture. Saturn was associated with the harvest, and was held to have been in charge during a golden age in which humans lived in a world of bounteous abundance and equality. And so not only did Saturnalia feature much feasting, but also role reversal, in which masters waited on slaves, and slaves or other lower status people might be able to insult or order about their social betters. It should be remembered though that afterwards people went back to their normal roles, so this breaking of boundaries really served to define those boundaries. Other aspects of misrule were also a feature, including pranks and legal gambling, as was gift giving of either gag gifts or gifts of candles, perhaps representing the solstice as a time of the longest night and the lengthening of the days henceforth. Because of an odd and yet in many ways appropriate phonological similarity, the Greek god Cronus, father of Zeus, became associated with Chronos, the personification of time. There is in fact a logical connection there because a god of agriculture would obviously be connected to the seasons, from which humans gain their perception of the passage of time. In any case, from this blending we get the figure of Father Time, often depicted at New Year with his agricultural implement the sickle or scythe. Another modern echo of Saturnalia may lie in the office Christmas party, which features a slackening of normal business place hierarchies and bosses often serving out food to their employees. Not that I recommend you take the opportunity to tell your boss what you really think of them. In the period of the later Roman Empire, in what was perhaps an even stronger influence on the date of Christmas, was the celebration of the Dies Natalis Solis Invictis, or Day of Birth of the Unconquered Sun, celebrated on December 25th. In another example of syncretism, this worship of the sun god was absorbed from the older Syrian cult of the Unconquered Sun during the 220s, and made official under the Emperor Aurelian in 274. After Christianity was officially declared the state religion of the Roman Empire, there seems to have been a shift in celebrating the birthday of the sun god to the birthday of the son of god, if you'll excuse the anachronistic pun which doesn't work at all in Latin. So with all these winter festivals clustering around the winter solstice, let's have a look at the solstice itself. The solstice is of course a precisely measurable date, when the sun is directly overhead at noon, so it's not surprising that many cultures have some sort of festival or ritual associated with it. The word solstice means literally sun standing still, from Latin sol, sun, and sistera, to stand still, a reduplicative form of stare, to stand, because the sun appears to rise and set in the same places for a few days around the solstice. The solstice of course also marks the longest night of the year, with the days getting progressively longer afterwards, so many traditions celebrate it as the return of the sun, by lighting candles or bonfires, and remember the gift of candles in Saturnalia. 
Many stone monuments in the British Isles, such as Stonehenge in England and Newgrange in Ireland, are aligned so that the rising sun at the winter solstice appears through a particular aperture. And the game Snapdragon, played at least since the 17th century, in which a tray or shallow bowl of warm brandy with raisins in it is set alight and the participants are to snatch raisins out of the flames and eat them, is often played around the solstice or Christmas. Furthermore, given that the solstice marks the winter season, when times are cold and harsh and food is about to become scarce, having a big feast makes a lot of sense. The winter season follows the harvest, and it is a time of animal slaughter when you would kill excess animals so you didn't have to feed them all through the winter. Now some of that food would be preserved, but it makes sense to have a bunch of it right away while it's still fresh, and you might want to make sacrifices to the gods to make sure the food supply is good in the year to come when it's growing and breeding season again and in particularly cold regions you might decorate with a few plants that remain green in the winter, like conifers, holly, and mistletoe, as a symbol of life and rebirth. And we've already seen those myths and rituals associated with gods who die and are reborn, particularly relevant at the time of the rebirth of the year. Another example of just such a midwinter festival which has influenced our modern Christmas traditions is the Germanic festival called Yule, a name now used to refer to Christmas itself, and if you want to see more specifics about Yule you can have a look at our Christmas video from a few years ago. I won't repeat all of that here, but there are a few elements I want to draw attention to. Yule, or Yole in Old English, seems to have encompassed the entire period, with Yule Monath being equivalent to both December and January. It seems to have involved the slaughtering of livestock, probably including sacrifices, which may survive in the tradition of the Christmas ham, as well as the beer produced from the grain harvest. The month before Yule was Blotmonath, sacrifice month, or Blodmonath, blood month, corresponding to November and suggesting animal sacrifice in the midwinter season. The word bloat, meaning sacrifice, in both Old English and Old Norse, is related to the word blood, as well as the word bless, coming ultimately from a Proto-Indo-European root bell to blow or swell. In Norse tradition there were a number of bloats associated with this time of year. There was the Disa bloat in honour of the Disir, possibly originally fertility goddesses but later becoming more generalised, along with the Valkyrie, which is a more public festival held at the beginning of the winter season known as Winter Nights along with Alpha Bloat, or Elven Sacrifice, which was a more private ritual held in the home excluding strangers. Later on in the winter season there was Thora Bloat, held at midwinter, which seems to have originally been a sacrifice to Thor, but later was reinterpreted as involving Thori, a personification of frost. This tradition was revived in the 19th and 20th centuries, particularly in Iceland, as a celebration of traditional Icelandic cuisine, referred to as Thoramatur, consisting of various cured meats and fish served with dense dark rye bread, including pressed ram's testicles and seal flippers cured in lactic acid, and fermented shark, all consumed with copious amounts of brenovin, a kind of Icelandic aquavit. Such is the strong associations with traditional foods in these kinds of ritual festivities. In Anglo-Saxon England on December 24th was Modranicht, or Mother's Night. We don't know much about this festival aside from a brief reference from the undoubtedly biased Christian monk Bede, but it has been speculated that it might be connected with the Scandinavian Desir or Germanic slash Celtic Matres and Matronae, or Mothers and Matrons, that were venerated in northwestern Europe with votives and altars depicting the three deities in the 1st to 5th centuries. For a different take on a midwinter festival, the Inuit tradition of Quivia Sugvik has a different kind of tie to seasonal food production, marking the beginning of the hunting season. Quivia Sugvik, meaning literally time of happiness, from Quiviasuk to be happy, occurs around late fall, early winter, or at the winter solstice, and though traditions differ, it frequently involves shamans known as Anga Kuit entering a hut in the evening and offering prayers for the community and to propitiate the spirits of the dead and the goddess of the sea Sedna. Again there are different versions of the story with different motivations, but one way or another Sedna is cast overboard into the water by her father who then chops off her fingers so she lets go of the kayak which she's clinging to, and the fingers become seals and other marine animals that the Inuit hunt, and Sedna becomes the goddess of the sea and marine animals. Because Sedna is a vengeful figure she must be placated in order to have a good hunting season. On the following day after the prayers the whole community would participate in various rituals including a tug of war with a sealskin rope with two teams designated as the ducks and ptarmigans, and if the ducks win the weather will be fine through the winter, but if the ducks lose it means a long and difficult winter. 
There is also a ritual in which everyone sits in a circle around a container of water, with each eating their meat at the same time while wishing for good tidings from Sedna, and then each in turn from the oldest to the youngest, scooping a drink of water from the middle and stating the time and place of their birth. Today in the Inupiaq language Kuvia Sugvik is now used to mean holiday, and in Arctic Quebec and Labrador Kuvia Suvik refers to Christmas, no doubt reflecting the suppression of indigenous cultures by the Canadian colonial government. In another example of a differing climate and food production season, the ancient Greeks held a festival in honour of the gods Poseidon, Demeter and Dionysus at the winter solstice. The winter setting is a while after the grain harvest, which would have been more appropriate for Demeter, goddess of agriculture, but timely for the grape harvest, as Dionysus was associated with wine. Again the specifics differed from city to city, as do the names of the festivals. At Eleusis the festival was called Halloea from the Greek word halos, meaning threshing floor, where the edible part of the grain is separated from the chaff, an appropriate location for Demeter, with the men and women separated on the first night. The women celebrated inside with copious wine and food, and especially with cakes in the shape of genitalia, both male and female. They would hold up either these cakes or other symbols of genitalia, engage in lewd banter, and the priestesses would tease them by whispering in their ears about promiscuity. The men outside would light bonfires, that common element of light in the darkness of the winter solstice. In another version of the festival, called Paloria, a great feast was held with tables heaped with food at which strangers were welcomed, prisoners were freed, and slaves were served by their masters, much like the Roman Saturnalia. These are the basic common elements of all of the versions of this festival, excessive feasting, reversal of social norms, and especially scurrilous conduct, with the men and women separated at first and then coming together the next day to engage in lewd banter with one another, and the symbolism of Poseidon, one of the most lustful gods, who reigned over not only the ocean but also inland streams, suggested male potency, watering the fertile fields associated with Demeter, thus ensuring successful crops in the new year. And speaking of the new year, it is thus not surprising that the turning of the year is often, though admittedly not always, around the time of the winter solstice, with the year being divided into appropriate seasons. The word season is actually directly connected to agriculture. Season comes through Old French from the Latin word serera to sow or plant, which is not at all related to the verb serera to join that we saw lying behind the word desert. So there's another example of polysemy for you. It ultimately comes from the Proto-Indo-European root se to sow, which also gives us the word seed through the Germanic branch. So a season was originally a time for sowing seeds, and later broadened to refer to other important times in the agricultural year. Winter is a Germanic word, its deeper etymology is not entirely certain, but it might come from the Proto-Indo-European root wade to see, which came into the Celtic languages with the sense white, in which case winter is the white season but more likely it comes from the root wed, meaning water or wet, which also gives us the words water and wet, in which case winter is the wet season. Depending on the climate where you live you may have differing opinions about this etymology, but this word is not the usual Proto-Indo-European word for this season. Proto-Indo-European ge means winter, and produces Latin hiem meaning winter, as well as the verb hiberno to pass the winter, from which English gets the words hibernate and hibernation, which may have first been used to refer specifically to the winter dormancy period of animals by Erasmus Darwin, grandfather of evolutionist Charles. That same Proto-Indo-European root lies behind the name Himalaya, along with the root slay, sticky, so literally the place where snow sticks or stays and through Greek chyma, winter weather, cold or frost, gives us the mythical animal chimera, meaning literally year old she-goat, from the notion of counting years in winters. But I don't think you'll see Santa's sleigh being pulled by chimeras. Now of course there are two solstices in the year, the winter and the summer, and it's been argued that Old English and other Germanic languages may have originally had a two-season system, with Old English winter and sumor. The word summer and Old English sumor come therefore from a common Germanic root which is traceable back to the Proto-Indo-European root sem, summer, with a variety of descendants in other Indo-European languages, meaning either summer or sometimes season or year. It comes into Irish as sam, meaning sun or summer, and may lie behind Samhain, meaning something like summer's end, the Irish harvest festival that may have influenced Halloween, unless it comes from a different root sem, meaning together. Certainly as we have the seasons now there is a division into four. 
between winter and summer is spring, whose etymology is exactly what it sounds like, the springing of the year when the plants begin to rise from the ground, and by the way you can compare this with the spring of water from the ground. This word is traceable back to the Proto-Indo-European root sperg to move hasten or spring, and though the verb springon is found in Old English, spring as a name for the season didn't occur until around 1400. Before that the season was referred to with the Old English word lengthen, later shortened to Lent, a word that was later adopted to refer to the forty days of abstemiousness leading up to Easter in the Christian calendar, in which, among other things, Christians are supposed to abstain from particularly lavish foods. The word originally had nothing to do with Christianity though, and was just a seasonal word coming from the Germanic elements langas long, from which we get the word long, and tina day, ultimately from the Proto-Indo-European root dieu shine, which also led to the Latin word dies day, thus giving us the English words diary and diurnal, but surprisingly unrelated to the English word day, which comes instead from the Proto-Indo-European root ag, meaning day. So the idea of the season Lent is that the days are growing longer, leading up to the summer solstice. Now before the Christian period of Lent, which begins on Ash Wednesday, is Fat Tuesday, also known by its French equivalent Mardi Gras, or simply Carnival. The word carnival probably literally means flesh raising, or in other words the removal of meat, because during Lent meat is one of those lavish foods often given up. So Fat Tuesday slash Mardi Gras, or Carnival, is the last chance to enjoy meat think carnivore, and fatty foods for a while, and also features a number of other excesses and reversal rituals in which you can flout the normal boundaries of society. There was a medieval folk etymology that carnival meant flesh farewell from Latin wale, goodbye, but in fact the etymons are caro, flesh, originally a piece of flesh, and lavare, to lighten, raise, or remove. That first element caro is kind of interesting, as it goes back to the Proto-Indo-European root scare, meaning to cut, hence that meaning of a piece of flesh. This root also gives us the word share, from the notion of cutting something up into portions, which is something you might do with your food. This root may also lead back to another root, carp, to gather, pluck, or harvest, which led to the Latin word carpora, pick or pluck. This Latin word is perhaps most famous from the phrase carpe diem, usually translated as seize the day, but the metaphor at work here is really a harvesting metaphor, like harvest your crops when they're ripe before they go bad. When prefixed with Latin ex, out of, carpera eventually gives us the word scarce, which develops from the sense of being plucked out and therefore rare, and meat and other foods might well be scarce after the harvest season and into the lean winter months. Another word we get from Proto-Indo-European carp, through the Germanic branch, is harvest, and Old English harvest was the original English term for the season between summer and winter. By the 14th century harvest in this sense began to be replaced by autumn, which came into English through Old French from Latin autumnus meaning autumn. Earlier etymology than that is uncertain, with most dismissing it as coming from another one of those unknown Etruscan sources, though one Latin etymologist posits that it might mean drying up season and giving the root as auc, or perhaps sous, dry, a root which not only gives us the words seer and seer through the Germanic branch, but also austere through Latin and Greek. The Romans themselves connected the word to the verb augera, to increase, and though it may not come from that source, it may have been influenced by it. Whatever the case, we also have the word fall from the idea of leaves falling from the trees, and though some Brits dismissed this as an Americanism, fall first appeared in British English in the 1660s, a shortening of the expression fall of the leaf from the 1540s, and was preserved in American English, though later dropped in British English. And those are the seasons of the year. As for the word year itself, it comes from a Proto-Indo-European time word year, year or season but also comes into English through Greek hora, season, time of day, giving us the word hour. This root may be traceable further back to the root a, meaning to go, from the notion of time proceeding, in which case it would appropriately be cognate with the word January, the first month of the year. Except it wasn't always. In the original ten-month Roman calendar the year began with March, the month of the god of war Mars according to the Romans which is why December literally means the tenth month, even though we now count it as the twelfth, the name just stuck. In the old Roman calendar December was followed by a bunch of days that didn't belong to any month, before the next month of March started again, but later on those extra days were organized into the months of January and February. January comes from the word Janus, archway, and the name Janus, or Janus as he's now called. 
god of doorways and of the beginning of the year, who is usually depicted with two faces pointing in opposite directions, thus looking forwards and backwards, and symbolising both beginnings and endings. By the way, we also get the word janitor from this word, as Latin janitor meant doorkeeper, as the word janitor in English originally did before broadening in meaning to caretaker of a building in the 18th century. In the feast called Calendae, sacred to Janus, which ran from January 1st to 3rd, the Romans engaged in feasting and merrymaking, as well as the exchange of gifts thought to bring good luck in the coming year, gifts of figs, honey, pastry, and coins. Today the most common New Year tradition is fireworks, as well as other types of noisemakers, and I should note at this point that the word bang comes into English from Old Norse banga, to pound or hammer, perhaps reminding us of Thor's famous hammer ultimately from the Proto-Indo-European root beg, to break, which we saw before as lying behind the word banquet. And speaking of noisemakers, they also make an appearance at Christmas in the form of Christmas crackers, traditional accompaniments to Christmas dinner. These were originally called bonbons, invented, so the story goes, by one Tom Smith of London, a sweets manufacturer, and you can see the similarity in the appearance of Christmas crackers and candy wrappers. When his sweets started to become less popular he began to include other things, like love messages and trinkets, and got the idea of adding the crack when he noticed a log he had thrown on the fire crackling. These then started to be marketed as Cossack, in reference to the Russian soldiers known as Cossacks, because of the sound of their cracking whips or gunfire. The paper hats that we now find in Christmas crackers are said to be a holdover of an old Saturnalian tradition. Of course the celebration of New Year hasn't always been popular or encouraged. Medieval Christians downplayed it as being kind of pagan, with, for instance, the Anglo-Saxon Archbishop Wulstan of York condemning the nonsense which is performed on New Year's Day in various kinds of sorcery. In Scotland of the 17th century, radical Protestants stamped out all the merrymaking associated with Christmas as being too papist, which then became part of their secular New Year tradition called Hogmanay. The dour Scottish Protestants then condemned Hogmanay, but the tradition continued. The origin of the word hogmanay is much debated, but what is clear is that it certainly doesn't come from a Celtic root. Most likely it comes from Old French aguilleneuf, a contraction of accueilli la neuf, welcome the new year. The most famous rituals of hogmanay include first footing, in which a tall dark man carrying coal must be the first to cross the threshold in the new year in order to bring good luck. Also the tradition of singing Robert Burns's Old Lang Syne at the stroke of midnight has become a general New Year tradition, not just for Hogmanay. The oft misunderstood Scots title of the song can be translated literally into English as Old Long Since, or in other words, Old Times or Days Gone By. The word sign, cognate with since, comes from Old English sithan, afterwards, hereafter, from the Proto-Indo-European root se meaning long or late which may be related to the other Proto-Indo-European root se, meaning to sow, which as we've seen gives us the word season. Now getting back to the concept we started with, polysemy, the word season has another sense, more directly related to food. Seasoning as in ingredients you add to food to add flavour, such as salt, spices, and herbs. So how do we get from seasons of the year to seasoning in our food? Well, it comes from the idea of ripening food, such as fruit, to make it more palatable. So seasoning food by adding flavours to it is akin to seasoning food by ripening it. And that brings us back to where we started, with food and feasting. The tradition of having a Christmas ham may go back to the Germanic Yule Boar or Sonargelter in Old Norse, meaning sacrificial boar, which was sacrificed in the Sonarblot, there's that sacrifice word again, part of the Yule feast. There was a ritual involved called the hate stringing, in which oaths were taken, often after considerable feasting and drinking, with hands laid on the bristles of the boar. The boar was associated with the Norse fertility god Freyr, and it was customary to sacrifice a boar as part of the pagan Yule celebration to ensure fertility in the coming year. This is reflected in the song The Boar's Head Carol, and as we've already seen, slaughtering most of your livestock before winter makes good sense, since then you don't have to feed them all when food is scarce and a new set of animals will be born in the spring. The other traditional meat served at Christmas is the roast goose, which may be tied to the English Harvest Festival of St. Martin's Day, or Martinmas, which falls on November 11th, and which picked up its elements of feasting and harvest celebration in addition to its religious elements after the fact because of its timing. It's connected with eating goose, though, because of a story about its eponymous saint, Martin of Tours who upon hearing that he was to be made bishop, and not wanting the job, tried to hide in a goose pen until the cackling of the geese gave him away. 
This feasting day, interestingly, has further connections to Carnival, as Martin Mass is often seen as a mini Carnival, coming before the abstemious period of Advent, itself seen as a mini version of Lent, leading up to Christmas. Now whether you're feasting on goose or ham, celebrating the festivals of midwinter or Christmas tide, seasoning your banquet for the festivities of the solstice, or in any way marking the turning of the seasons, I hope this video has brought some light to the darkness. So I have a few little details, things that I didn't have time to include. <laughs> Which is kind of amazing because we included an awful lot in that oh, one. <laughs> but there's always more. It's endless. It's an endless, endless knot. <laughs> Uh -huh. <laughs> so the starting point of course was feasts and meals mm -hmm. and food and stuff. So I talked about words like feast, banquet, and potluck. But the, you know, the sort of obvious word, the umbrella term meal, I didn't mention. And originally the word meal referred to the timing of the repast. So it comes from the Proto-Indo-European root me, which means to measure. Okay. And also gives us words such as measure, meter, and moon and month, you know, which mm -hmm. is a period of time measured by the cycles of the moon. So a meal is literally a measured or fixed time for eating. Right. Okay. So it doesn't refer directly to the to food. The food. Eating, just the, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Interesting. By the way, the original sense of the word meal is preserved in the word piecemeal, literally measured piece by piece. Oh. Yeah. So it's the same, it is the same word, Never meal, the meal and that. piecemeal is meal, but oh, it's that okay. earlier sense of the word. Whereas the, the word meal in the other sense, such as oatmeal, is unrelated. It comes from a separate root that means to grind. Connected to milling. Yeah. So right. the, that root is mela, Proto-Indo-European mela. So it's, it's the source of words such as mill, molar, teeth you use to grind your food, mm -hmm. maelstrom, I quite like that. Mm, a storm, <laughs> a that, storm that, that grinds, grinds you, you up. down. Yeah. <laughs> moulin, the French word mm -hmm. for mill, as in moulin rouge, a word that that over the course of I think it was was it this year or last year it became a, a sort of political word of interest emolument. Oh yeah, I don't even know the political cycle goes so fast now. I can't, <laughs> I can't remember, remember when what it was, it was but it was suddenly <laughs> in the news. Well, this comes from the idea of a payment to a miller. So an emolument is what you paid a miller mm -hmm. okay. originally. Immolate, which is... To burn well, completely. Yeah. And it, so it's from the religious sense originally, like a sacrifice. And it comes from the idea of originally to sprinkle with a sacrificial meal. Yes. Right. Yes. Which is an important part of a Roman sacrifice mm -hmm. is to take with sacrificial meal in the sense of milled grain. Milled grain, yeah. So it, immolate does, is not connected to any burning root. It's just anything. that you also burn the sacrifice. You also burn the sacrifice. Yeah, so it has, it's, it's okay. kind of drifted in that direction. Also malleable from Latin malleus hammer. Right, it's so, something that can be shaped. Shaped, yeah. Maul, as in an animal mauling you. Mm-hmm chewing you up or whatever. <laughs> nice. <laughs> and interestingly, if you've been keeping up with recent videos that we've been doing, blini or blints, which I talked about in the video Sabbath. And while we're at it, I may as well mention that the word food can be traced back to the Proto-Indo-European root pa, meaning to protect or feed which also gives us the words feed, fodder, and forage. Okay, that makes sense. Now, I also talked about the development of the dessert and all that stuff about multiple courses in yeah, meals. Right. And so just a bit more detail about that, it's particularly tied to this shift from the service à la française, in which there's a setting, setting of a variety of dishes on the table at the same time. Right. You put so everything you out put at once. Everything out at once. A shift from that practice to what's called the service à la russe, presenting a meal in courses. Mm. Okay. And so that's where we get that idea of unserving, right. and desivier, and, and, and therefore dessert. The yeah. Interesting, because way back to the Roman meal mm -hmm. was served in courses. Ah, okay. Because you brought each 
table inn. Mm -hmm. So you had the, in a Roman sort of, you know, fancy or formal dinner, you had people lying three to a couch in a horseshoe shape, three mm -hmm. couches, three, whatever you want to call them, mm -hmm. couches, seats, and three people on each. So you'd have nine, but only in a horseshoe shape because you have to leave one side open because the slaves would bring in, they'd bring in the first course, which would be tables for each couch that would go uh -huh. in front of the people, which would have the food on it. And then you'd eat the food. And then that whole table would be taken away and another table would be brought in mm -hmm. rather than bringing individual dishes in. I mean, mm -hmm. there were, uh, you know, of course, there were different ways that it was done. It wasn't always done the same way, but that was basically what it was. And so you'd have a series of uh, sort of appetizer things and then main dishes and then fruits and nuts to finish off. Hmm. The Roman dinner went from eggs to nuts. Ab ovo. No, from eggs to fruit. Okay. Ab ovo ad mala, because eggs were considered the sort of, you'd have some sort of kind of eggs or egg dish in the first course, and mm -hmm. you'd have fruits and nuts in the last. That sort of reminds me of the tradition of the the omelette course. Yeah, <laughs> except that, that, that you think of the omelette course coming last. Last, as a dessert, yeah. with, It's the other way around. The yeah. eggs were the first course. Thing. Okay. Yeah. Well, the service à la française, I think, became sort of the, the thing for formal dining in kind of the 17th century or so. Okay, right. But, yeah, I mean, obviously there's... A millennia or a millennium or more between the Roman dining yes. habits and what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure it went through many, many different permutations. Mm -hmm. Well, in, in, in the Middle Ages, it yeah. was also that same idea. You would put all the food out. And, right. But it came to be replaced by service à la Russe, the, the Russian style, over the course of the 19th century. And we even know how that happened. So it was the Russian ambassador, Alexander Kurakin, who is credited with bringing this, this style of eating mm -hmm. from Russia to France in 1810 at a meal in Clinchy, uh, a French town, <laughs> Clinchy, okay. on the outskirts of Paris. So this guy, Kurakin, he, he was not well liked by Catherine the Great, by the way. After her death, he sort of, his star sort of went back on the rise again. He, he sort of came from a, a kind of family of sort of diplomats and so forth, but he was sort of back on the you know on the on the inside of political affairs after her death, and as a result, he eventually became an ambassador and was eventually posted to France, where he was historically important in warning the Russians of Napoleon's intentions to invade Russia. Okay. And also dinner service. And also dinner service. <laughs> yeah, so that's that's another claim to fame. He has a third claim to fame. So in Paris's, you know, elite, Karakin was famously referred to as a diamond prince in reference to his sort of magnificence and richness of his clothing. He wore very ornate capes and clothes okay. and things. Maybe even diamonds. <laughs> Maybe even diamonds. Probably some of them were. Well, the really kind of entertaining story is that, well, entertaining, but also maybe slightly disturbing. It was, it was one of these fancy outfits that saved his life during a fire that happened during a ball given by the Austrian ambassador Schwarzenberg on July 1st, 1810, while ex escorting the women out of the blazing hall he... escorting escorting yes yeah, with a, with a, 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 a hand gently yes. cupping the elbow let as me, he just let, let me take you to I safety yes. <laughs> escort yes. you this way ladies uh -huh. well you know he was a he was a classy guy i guess uh -huh. well uh while performing this particular function he tripped and fell to the ground and was trampled by the panicking crowd because oh. you know the building was burning down yeah. however his richly decorated coat protected him from the worst of the intense heat <laughs> and so he survived he was still kind of you know badly burned and and confined to bed for several yeah. months afterwards but he survived because of his you know, diamond outfit. privilege. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, word to the wise, wear jewels all over your clothes. <laughs> it will protect you from fires. Yeah. Don't take our advice on anything ever. <laughs> and especially not that. 
One last point about different serving styles. Uh There is also a less formal style known as service à l'anglaise, the English service, Mm -hmm. as it is. Well, so-called in France. We were assuming, (laughs) I think all of us were assuming these these were French French, terms. (laughs) With the hostess serving out the soup at one end of the table and later the host carving a joint of meat at the other end and then the servants kind of ferrying the right, food out. Right, serving it all out. Right, yeah. right. And then the various other dishes, the vegetables or whatever, what have you, were served by the diners themselves. Right. Which is basically how dinner, you know, Thanksgiving or Christmas or something now yeah. works. Yeah. And it's right? less formal. It's a sort of family style, I yeah. guess you can almost say. Yeah, yeah. But with somebody carving. With somebody carving. But, you know, that is the tradition. That's the ritual. Mm-hmm. Again, I'm doing air quotes. The ritual <laughs> now is, right, the the father of the household or whatever ritually carves the turkey at the table and, you know, it gets served out. Now, I talked about, you know, New Year's traditions. There are, of course, many, many different New Year's traditions around the world and many many different times of the year that is considered Considered New Year. A couple that I will mention that specifically involve food, the Babylonians started their New Year at the beginning of the planting season in spring, and they would, at that point, hold an 11-day festival. There's similar feast-related festivals in other parts of the world at around the time of midwinter, such as Yalda Night, which is an Iranian festival held on the winter solstice, mm-hmm. and featured the eating of foods such as nuts and fruits, such as pomegranates and watermelon, as well as the reading of poetry well into the night. So I will ask our listeners if they want to send us in their New Year's or solstice food-related traditions. I'd love to hear more. Mm -hmm. You know, I only know of a few, but Mm -hmm. I'm sure there are lots of interesting ones out there. Mm -hmm. We already talked about the Snapdragon, which is our solstice one. Yes, exactly. Because we do a solstice Snapdragon and have infected others with it. Mm Mm-hmm. Now, next, a little bit more detail about the word season. It's interesting that the food sense of the word season, as in to season your food by adding salt or spices or whatever, Mm -hmm. that's first attested in the in the Middle English poem Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. Believe (laughs) it or not, favorite. Which is a story tied to this time of year. It's a story that takes place between Christmas and New Year and describes a lot of lavish feasting during the festive seasons. A lot Mm -hmm. of the sort of... Yeah, it's all about the sort of... Fancy parts of the poem describe in detail Mm -hmm. that festival, the feasting. And there are additionally some fascinating parallels between this medieval poem and the old, Old English poem Beowulf and the Dr. Seuss story, How the Grinch Stole Christmas, which famously features roast beast instead of ro- roast, roast beef. beef. Yeah. Right. So basically, the, there's an underlying folktale, folktale motif of a strange, supernatural, monstrous being coming to the hall at sort of Christmas Yule and causing trouble of some sort. Right. And so the Beowulf poem, although it's not specifically described as this happening at... Christmas, Christmas it's there's a very close parallel to the story in the Norse tradition that there must mm-hmm. be some relation to between the two. It's in the Norse saga, King Hrolf saga or Hrolf saga Kraki, in which the monster comes every year at Yule specifically. Yeah. You talk about this in your Yule video. I talk about this back, in the yeah. Yule video. And so you can, if you know, you can go back and have a look at that one if you want to hear more about all of this. But evidently, Ted Giesel, Dr. Seuss, otherwise, <laughs> yes. otherwise known, known as Dr. Seuss, and only actually only known, known as, as Dr. Seuss. <laughs> Dr. Seuss yeah. He was a student at Oxford University while J.R.R. Tolkien, who was a notable scholar and translator of Sir Gawain and the Green Knight and Beowulf, as well as, of course, author of Lord of the Rings, mm-hmm. you might have heard of that. Vaguely rings a bell. <laughs> Well, he, at that time, held the Rawlinson and Bosworth Professorship of Anglo-Saxon at Oxford, while Dr. Seuss was a student there, student of English literature. So he may well have heard about Gawain and and the Green Knight Knight from Tolkien and was inspired to create the Grinch. 
Hmm. So, I mean, basically the Grinch is and Grendel Grindel. is the Green Knight. There, it's, mm -hmm. it's all the same. It's all coming together. Yeah. <laughs> so, in terms of seasons, what do you have to tell us about seasons? <laughs> so, this is a little, I mean, it's not directly related to what you're talking about, but since the only connection I can ever make to anything is classical. I mean, I know nothing about anything well, and, else. And Snapdragon. You know, and Snapdragon. Got... Yeah, yeah. I got, I got one thing. You got your things. <laughs> one thing. <laughs> no, I was just, I was thinking about seasons. You talk about the four seasons, and I just thought it would be interesting to look back to one of the earliest classical descriptions of seasons that we have, which is in Hesiod. So Hesiod, of course, wrote well, two works. Seasons. This is Works and Days. That... Yeah, so this is the Works and Days which is his, do I get into the discussion of who Hesiod is? Anyway, Hesiod... Well, he tells us in that poem, right? If we yes, believe that. If we, <laughs> very important key. If we believe that, and if that's the same person as wrote the Theogony. Theogony. Right. Does anyway. He, does he describe himself in the Theogony? No. Or, so it's only well, in... Well, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Complicated. Maybe let's not get into it. <laughs> anyway. Hesiod is traditionally the name mm. of the poet who wrote two works known as the Theogony and the Works and Days. The Theogony is a story about the creation of the universe and cosmogony and the birth of the gods. But the Works and Days is a much more sort of down to earth, <laughs> literally, mm -hmm. work addressed at least nominally to his brother his lazy ass brother his lazy well his fraudulent brother fraudulent his lazy, brother. lazy and fraudulent brother <laughs> <laughs> and some other fragmentary stuff that's or stuff that's lost and only exists in fragments he wrote some time between the 8th and 6th century bc around the same time as homer and he lives in boeotia yeah i know it all homer. it's all very complicated like anyway more Point being, <laughs> this is one of the earliest works we have in Greek written down as literature. And it's it's got all sorts of things that you know, like the, the Pandora story is in there, though it's also in the other one, but it, the Pandora story is there. But there's some other stuff that's important. He has one that's one issue that's really famous is that he talks about two strifes, how there's good strife and bad strife. The mm. good strife is the kind of rivalry that makes you want to outdo your neighbor. Mm. Bad strife is the kind that leads to war. The idea of competition versus... Right. Um, so which, very folksy philosophy. Yeah, there's a lot of advice and gnomic stuff, a mm -hmm. lot of stuff about this is how the world is and this is how you should live. Mm -hmm. And so, yes. It's Wisdom a, literature. Yeah, it is. It's absolutely. And so he's addressing his brother, Perseus, and he's telling him to be sensible and not steal their inheritance. And he has a lot of bad things to say about corrupt judges. But a lot of the poem is just about farming. And about what you should do. And so what I thought I'd just spend a little time on is thinking about the seasons. Because a lot of it's about what to do when. Hmm. Right? It's the works and the days. Right. What days should you, you do, do the works? works. Yeah. Right? What was interesting about it is how he tells what those seasons are. Mm -hmm. So you're talking about winter and summer and spring and fall, of course, are the seasons we think of. He doesn't. He never uses words like that. Hmm. He All of his seasonal markers are, so there's astronomical ones, the stars, when right. particular constellations rise and set. There's weather, mm -hmm. like when mm -hmm. the certain winds blow and certain things happen. And then there's nature. So there's when animals, certain animals do certain things or certain plants do certain things. And that's what marks you as what you should do. Now, I mean, that's not particularly surprising. We all know that the year works in those ways, though probably astronomical is the one we use the least mm. now. Mm. If you think about how how you run your days, I mean, we know when the solstice is, but we don't really sort of move that way, except that we're told that it's happening. But the others all make sense. But I think it's kind of interesting that he's not thinking in terms of now in the winter, do this in the summer. Like, it's not that he might not divide the year into four, but he doesn't do that in any kind of formal way. Mm. So, for instance, after a lot of stuff where he just basically tells a lot of advice about not being greedy and not being lazy and all of that sort of stuff, he finally turns to specific advice. When he gets into that, it starts with, when the Pleiades, daughters of Atlas, are rising, begin your harvest and your plowing when they are going to set. Okay. Now, the addition 
here tells us that the Pleiades rise in early May. So that's when you begin your harvest. Mm -hmm. And that already is a thing that we, we've talked about this before, the difference between the Mediterranean seasons and the, you know, you couldn't harvest anything in May in Sudbury. Right. <laughs> You'd be lucky to be harvesting anything other than a crocus. You could harvest some mud. Yep, that's about it. And you plow when they are going to set, and the edition tells us that's November. Okay. Okay. Forty days and nights they are hidden and appear again as the year moves round when first you sharpen your sickle. This is the law of the plains and those who live near the sea and those who inhabit rich country. And I just have to read this because it's the translation that is online that's, you know, a free old one. Right. Those who inhabit rich country, the glens and dingles far from the tossing sea. <laughs> dingles. Dingles. I love the word dingles. It's one of my favorite, like, landscape words. Mm. That's irrelevant. I just wanted to get it in. So he says, you have to make sure you plow at the right time. If you don't, you're going to be in trouble. Foolish Percy's work the work which the gods ordain for men, lest in bitter anguish of spirit you with your wife and children seek your livelihood amongst your neighbors and they do not heed you. Brothers are always lazy ass. Yeah, he doesn't like his brother. Then he tells you various offensive things about getting women and oxen and slaves and things. Let's leave all that aside. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, you know, one set of instructions. And then the next marking point. Mm -hmm. When the piercing power and sultry heat of the sun abate, an almighty Zeus sends the autumn rains, which the edition tells me is October. And men's flesh comes to feel far easier, for then the star Sirius passes over the heads of men who are born to misery only a little while by day and takes a greater share of night. So Sirius is starting to set. Right. Um, then when it showers its leaves to the ground and stops sprouting, the wood you cut with your axe is least liable to worm. Okay. So yeah. when it gets cooler, when it starts to rain, when the trees lose their leaves and stop sprouting, that's when you want to cut your wood down. And then he goes on to talk about, um, there's a whole big long thing about cutting down wood and making plows and ships and various other things like that. So again, so now we have a season mm -hmm. that, and he does mention the autumn, sure, but you, you see the sort of, he's not marking it by a calendar. He's marking it by what happens right. when, then when you hear the voice of the crane who cries year by year from the clouds above, for she gives the signal for plowing and shows the season of rainy winter, but she vexes the heart of the man who has no oxen. So that's presumably when the cranes who, who are migratory birds. Right. So we would hear probably mm -hmm. say like when the geese start to fly. Right. And so yeah, I guess, you know, he's, he's living in a very rural area, not in an urban center. So yeah, how no, would you know what time of year it is? Well, you look yeah, for so the I think, I think it's, signs in nature. That's, that's all. I mean, none, this isn't surprising or anything, yeah. but I think it's just interesting to see how a calendar, you know, he's trying to give you, as it were, uh, a formula. Mm -hmm. So he is trying to write down a calendar in a way right. that is not just do it when you think you need to. Um, it's a it, farmer's almanac. It, it is, exactly. And it's an early one for that. But it, it reminds us that the seasons come in ways that are specific to a place. Hmm. I guess that's what I'm saying. You know, the seasons matter because of where you are and how what you need to do is associated with that. So then it's time to plow. And he just talks about how fast you have to plow and have to, when you have to sow seeds. And the prayers you have to do, he talks about who you need to pray to and what you need to do in order to be able to do what you're doing. But if you plow the good ground at the solstice in the winter, you will reap sitting, grasping a thin crop in your hand. So if you wait too long and you don't plow until the solstice, mm -hmm. you won't have a good crop. Hmm. Then he talks about, but if, you, if you're lucky, if you plow late, when the, you might find this remedy when the cuckoo first calls in the leaves <laughs> of the oak and makes men glad all over the boundless earth. If Zeus should send rain on the third day and not cease until it rises neither above an ox's hoof nor falls short of it, then the late plower will buy with the early. So if you're lucky, if you plow late, but you get a lot of rain at the right time, you still might be okay. Then he tells you to not be lazy, even in the winter. While it is yet midsummer, command your slaves. It will not always be summer. Build barns. <laughs> of course. <laughs> Avoid the month. Lenion, which is late January, early February, tells me my edition. 
wretched days, all of them fit to skin an ox and the frosts which are cruel when Boreas blows over the earth. So this is about the time in the calendar, yes, but also about the north wind, Boreas, and how it's very cold and it blows through everybody and there's nothing you can do except to stay inside. Even the octopus sits inside. It's the weirdest line in Hesiod, I'm going to tell you. It does not blow through the tender maiden who stays indoors the wind with her dear mother, unlearned as yet in the works of golden Aphrodite, and who washes her soft body and anoints herself with oil and lies down in an inner room within the house. On a winter's day, when the boneless one, an octopus or squid, says my notes, <laughs> gnaws his foot in his fireless house and wretched home. So in the an deep octopus? winter, like when it's really cold out and everybody has to stay indoors the, because the it's really cold. Sleep. So the octopus stays inside his home with no fire and gnaws his foot. When he, That's how you know it's really bad winter. Is that a thing that happens with octopuses? Do they gnaw their feet? I have no idea <laughs> what it's about. I genuinely am completely baffled by that. The rest of it is all like then the horned and unhorned denizens of the wood with teeth chattering pitifully, flee, you know, everybody's cold, everybody's whatever, everybody's unhappy. All makes sense. Why this sudden reference to octopuses? <laughs> okay, so all of the cephalopod biologists out there, please send in your explanation as to why they would be gnawing their feet at this time yeah. of year. I mean, I get the fireless homes, but I think octopuses have fireless homes all, all the year <laughs> <laughs> though octopuses are pretty clever i wouldn't yeah. anyway it's very weird and then he they goes can on, move on and land, talks, you know. talks about like how you should dress in the winter and all of these things and do all these stuff until the year is ended and you have days and nights of equal length and right. earth the mother of all bears again her various fruit Equinox. and then when zeus has finished 60 wintry days after the solstice then the star arcturus leaves the holy stream of ocean and first rises brilliant at dusk. After him, the shrilly waiting daughter of Pandion, the swallow, appears to men when spring is just beginning. Before she comes, prune the vines, for it is rest so. Right. So we have a, both an astronomical and a natural sign. We have mm -hmm. Arcturus rising right. at dusk and the swallows returning. Right. But then when the house carrier the snail, climbs up the plants from the earth to that escape sounds... the Pleiades, then it is no longer the season for digging vineyards, but to wet your sickles and rouse up your slaves. Then it's hot and get up before the sun because the sun's going to be so hot, etc. But then when the artichoke, I'm not giving all this, but just it's the signs of what the seasons are that I find interesting. Mm. But when the artichoke flowers, apparently that's June, and the chirping grasshopper sits in a tree and pours down a shrill song continually from under his wings in the season wait, of wait, wearisome wait, wait. heat. In trees? The grasshopper? Grasshoppers in trees? Yeah. The chirping grasshopper sits in a tree. Do they sit in trees? I thought they sat on grass. <laughs> <laughs> I think actually probably means cicadas, which do sit in trees. Oh, okay. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I'm just reading translation here. <laughs> are they tree hoppers? <laughs> I think you're being Hopping a little literal. Hopping from tree to tree? <laughs> Majestically? I will say, this is the se season of wearisome heat. Then goats are plumpest and wine sweetest. Women are most wanton, but men are feeblest. <laughs> Maybe because of the wine? Because Sirius parches heads and knees and the skin is dry through heat. Ah. The dog star apparently makes okay. women lusty and men weak. The dog days. Yes. This is indeed where we get mm. our phrase dog days. Uh, somewhere. So and then again, set you slaves to winnow Demeter's holy grain when strong Orion first appears. And then he goes through when Orion and Sirius are coming to mid heaven and rosy fingered dawn sees Arcturus, then cut off all the grape, grape clusters and make wine. But when the Pleiades and Hyades and strong Orion begin to set, then remember to plow in season, and so the completed year will fitly pass beneath the earth. And he's done his whole right. season all the way around. And then he goes into an, a long, off, uh, side long thing about, but if you want to sail and go on the seas, boy, oh boy, is that a stupid idea, but here's mm. the time when you should do it. <laughs> so we'll leave that aside. Anyway, I just, I think it's, you know, in that list, there weren't four seasons. Right. There's a whole bunch of much more specific more marking yeah, mm -hmm. about what you should do, which of course makes sense. An agricultural mm -hmm. year does not only go in four seasons. Right. There are not only four things you have to do in the agricultural year. There's a mm -hmm. whole bunch of stuff you have to do. 
But I, I do think it's really interesting that it, combination of the astronomical and the natural because it suggests that people are tracking or that it's a useful thing to say to people oh mm -hmm. watch for this constellation when it starts to rise at dusk or when this is doing you know that that's a meaningful thing that people will be able mm -hmm. to track and be able to mark their time by right which you know i don't think now i obviously tell time in a completely different manner but even if you're talking to somebody who's lives on the land in some way as a farmer or hunter or something now how much do they know when the constellations rise right. you know to what degree is that a, a way that people are but of course people did for thousands of years think in those ways and i just think that's an interesting even though we we mark our years with the solstice we we look on the google calendar to tell us when the solstice is right I do not mark the place on the horizon that the sun is rising and wait until the day that it starts to move back and then say that was the solstice. We don't spend our all our time outside like he We spend did. almost no time outside. And for most people who live in cities, they can't even see yeah. the constellations most of the time. I mean, I have my few things that I know about. Like I know Ryan is up in the winter and I can see it, but I don't, mm -hmm. not in detail. I just know a couple of things. Other than that, I don't really know. So anyway. That's really all I wanted to say about seasons, but I thought that was kind of interesting. This suddenly made me think of the what the etymology of the word almanac is, and actually I bet you can guess broadly where it comes from. I mean, what language it comes from. Well, Arabic? Yeah. Because it starts all with Al. Almanac, <laughs> yes, exactly. So I looked it up to see exactly what the dealie was, but yeah, so <laughs> the dealio. So from Anglo-Latin, the old French medieval latin but it's not everyone necessarily agrees on this etymology but it is sometimes said to come from spanish arabic almanac meaning calendar almanac but possibly ultimately from late greek almenic no many kiakon meaning calendar i suppose nobody on this podcast can see my raised eyebrow <laughs> <laughs> which is said to be of coptic origin okay interesting yeah so and according to Adam Online, he writes, uh, this word has been the subject of much speculation, originally a book of permanent tables of astronomical data, one year versions combined with ecclesiastical calendars date from the 16th century. Astrological and weather predictions appear in 17th, 16th, 17th century. The useful statistics are a modern feature, and that is according to the OED. Okay. So there you go. There's the almanac. So another detail I want to kind of return to from the voiceover that we heard mm -hmm. some time ago now. <laughs> so I mentioned Celtic rituals that take place around midwinter. Mm -hmm. So on that topic, we get the somewhat confused connection between Druids, mistletoe, and midwinter, basically from the Roman writer Pliny. Pliny the Elder. Yes who recorded that the Gauls used mistletoe as an antidote to poison and as a fertility inducer to livestock, and that the Druids regarded it as especially sacred when it was found growing on an oak tree rather than the more usual apple tree. And so you get this sort of super mistletoe. The fancy mistletoe. The fancy mistletoe <laughs> if it's growing on the oak rather than the, the normal apple tree all right. of this is is relevant to to druids plausibly because the word druid is etymologically connected to the word tree so the tree worship and and so forth seems to have been a thing for yeah that gets Celtic mentioned religion. over and over again yeah. by people yeah more reliable than pliny and so there was a special ritual for collecting ritual uh, <laughs> for collecting this super mistletoe, this super effective mistletoe, that involved special animal sacrifices and feasting. Mm -hmm. So you can, I guess, imagine, therefore, the connection between the sort of fertility inducing mistletoe <laughs> and this time of the year that's fertility connected inducing. with... Yes, well... I don't know what that means. Well, I don't you're... know. You use it to make your... <laughs> I, animals yeah, or, I, don't I don't know. But in this time of year that is connected with renewal and mm -hmm. rebirth yeah, and yeah. all that, right? And so you can see that it might, hanging up mistletoe might be a, you know, kind of uses a special symbol around the, the solstice and the turning of the year, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. 
But it might simply be that the, you know, the hanging of mistletoe at this time of year is just another example of a plant that stays green during winter, like holly and conifers, right? right. So it's a broader, from that broader category. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that there's nothing particularly, particularly special about yes. mistletoe. Yeah. Except that, and also that it's easily, not easily gathered exactly because it's a bit prickly, but it's because it's a vine, you can kind of pull it off the trees. You right. don't have to hack it down as branches. Right. Yeah. As for the kissing part, the kissing under the mistletoe, mm -hmm. it might simply be connected to the fertility association of the plant, but there's another more Christian explanation. It was a custom in the 14th century in Britain to hang a small effigy of the Holy Family just inside the entrance to a house. And that would be then decorated with some form of greenery, either holly or mistletoe or whatever was available. Mm -hmm. And then the Holy Family was later removed as being possibly idolatrous, you know, <laughs> worshipping of idols and whatnot. Yeah. Leaving only the mistletoe under which people entering the house would naturally greet Exchange each other. the kiss of peace, right? yeah, or yeah. just a general kiss mm -hmm. greeting, yeah. And then after a while, that greeting of Christian love gradually turned into a less pious and chaste <laughs> kissing. A little more raunchy kissing, maybe? Or maybe in part as the kiss of greeting became less common. Yeah. And so there was a tradition that evolved, or, you know, that sort of evolved from this, mm -hmm. this thing, in which you would remove one of the berries from the sprig of mistletoe with each kiss. Mm. And then once all the berries were gone, the kissing had to stop. You know, <laughs> no a more little kissing. bit of kissing, but not too much. <laughs> <laughs> and as a sort of final point about all this, since it's become the tradition now for me to ruin Christmas with a very <laughs> lascivious or crude Christmas etymology or story, if I haven't already done that with this, you know, kissing under the mistletoe, mm -hmm. I will point out the etymology of the word mistletoe. Yeah, it's totally your favorite. Yes. It's your favorite etymology <laughs> of all the etymologies. <laughs> So mistletoe is a compound word, basically. It consists, uh, the second element is Old English tan, so tan becomes toe, mm -hmm. meaning twig. Mm -hmm. And the first element is Old English mistle, mm -hmm. which means mistletoe. It refers to the plant. Right. But it goes back to the Proto-Indo-European root meg, which means to urinate, or in the case of birds, to defecate because the mistletoe seeds are propagated through bird droppings. This, this, is, good. this is science. Here. It's serious <laughs> business. So the next time you're kissing under the mistletoe, you might want to remember that you're actually kissing under a poop twig. <laughs> or not. You might not want to remember that, actually. <laughs> I think you should. I mean, it's for science. <laughs> All right. Well, on that note. <laughs> on that note, let's return to rites and rituals. Right. A little bit more detail about that. So I, I mentioned the word rite and ritual. Mm -hmm. The word rite, usually, though not always, preserves the specifically religious sense of the Latin word ritus, mm -hmm. whereas ritual can refer to either a religious or a secular activity. But there are exceptions to this. So, for instance, you would talk about like a rite of passage, which right. can be religious, be religious, but it doesn't so have to be religious. It could be like your first shaving with yeah. your dad or exactly. something, right? That's exactly. a rite of passage. But there's a tendency for rite to maybe be a little more formal, religious, yeah. ritual being more secular. But more importantly, one thing that I didn't have time to talk about was the issue of liminality. I was talking a lot about this, you know, theories about ritual and so forth mm -hmm. and liminality is a really important concept to that yeah. area of study so liminality is the state of being outside of or between boundaries so it comes from a latin word that means you know the the shore basically the boundary between land and water whatever boundaries boundaries basically is the right. idea yeah and so Liminality might, for instance, refer to one being what one might be sort of during an initiation ritual. One might be, for instance, you know, if you're being like a hazing ritual or yeah, something like yeah. that, yeah. You, you're sort of moving from one state to one another. state to yeah. another. And so during that process, you would be sort of stripped of your status 
mm-hmm. and then as reemerge one and then come to another, on the other yeah. side with another status. And so this state of liminality can also be found in lots of other types of festivals and mm-hmm. rituals and mm-hmm. so forth. Mm-hmm. So this is a common thing. And we can see that in, in you know, a lot of the, the things that we that I talked that you about. talked about in, yeah. in there, yeah. The New Year's in particular is yeah. an obvious place of the liminality. Yeah. Between one year and another. So I believe you have something to tell us. Well, I was just respect. talking... It's, with the idea of rites and rituals and feasts, I thought I'd talk a little bit about a rite or a ritual, mm. a Roman ritual of feasts that is sort of, in some ways, the mirror image of what we've been talking about. Because you were talking about feasts as a time when, as part of a religious rite, you get together and everybody eats things. Mm. So there's an interesting feature of Roman religion that is called the lectisternium. And I will come back to what that word comes from, which is a ritual performed, especially in times of emergency, but can also be performed. Mm -hmm. There are some that are sort of uh, prescribed as as rotating feasts throughout the year, which is when you feast the gods. Now, all sacrifice to some extent is a feast to the gods, right? You 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 give the gods give the gods their portion, whether that's the blood or the smoke or whatever it is. The fat or you burn some of it and you eat the rest of it. So, you know, feasting, one of the reasons feasts are associated, the word feast becomes the word feast Mm. is because a lot of rituals long before Christianity had to do with food. food. Well, you you sacrifice an animal to the god, but that results in a bunch of flesh, which then is cooked and served to the celebrants. It'd be a shame to let that go to waste. Yeah, and it's it's part of participating in the right. in in that communion with God mm-hmm. in some form or another. But the lectisternium is a little more direct than that. You put effigies of the gods, so statues, there's some argument about exactly this is one of the many Roman rituals where we get references to it a lot but not a lot of mm-hmm. exact details. So either statues of various gods or maybe bundles of herbs with masks on them it's not clear right um on couches that would be the lecti Mm -hmm. and you put them on their couches and you put food in front of them so you make a dining like it's a dining scene think of a nativity scene but instead of a nativity scene you basically have like the gods statues of the gods laid out on the dining couches and then you put food in front of them and they eat the food right so that Lecti part comes from the Roman word for bed. The bed or couch. And then sternium comes from sternera, to strew, to oh, lay right. out. Okay, right. So it's a lecti sternium. It's a laying out of in front of the couches. Mm-hmm. So Livy tells us that the first one that happened of this, and there's debate about where it comes from, was it, there was a Greek rite that was similar called the kleine, which just means couch, and the theoxenia, which is a banquet for the gods. But in that case, the gods sort of host it. So the gods are there, but then the people eat. But in the Roman version, it's just for the gods. And you put the images on the couch or the couches. The couch is also called a pulvinar. Okay. And the ceremony is meant to propitiate the gods and repel the pest- a pestilence or an enemy. So it's in the time of plague or in particular in enemies. So Livy tells us it was first done in Rome in 399 BC. There was a great crisis and they consulted the Sibylline books, which were these books of prophecy that Rome sort of ran their religion on the basis of. That's for another discussion. And they told them to do this. And then usually it was like pairs of gods. And in this case, it was Apollo, Latona, who's a version of Apollo's mother, Hercules, Diana, Mercury, and Neptune. Mm. And so they were the gods that were put out. They were fed. And there are other crises where this happens. Then there's a couple of other rotating cult performances that this becomes a thing. And then later on, there can also be private lectisternia. At a birth, for instance, you might do a little feast for the gods to have them come and hmm. look over the, the baby. It's not really clear if it's Greek in origin or whether it's Etruscan in origin, because just like with words, right. religious rituals, Etruscan. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, like yeah. that is a lot of re- Roman religion does seem to have Etruscan roots. Right. 
of course, Etruscan is like this black hole because then you don't have to find roots for Etruscan yeah. stuff, which seems unfair. So some of the Etruscan stuff comes from the Greeks, yeah, but some of it doesn't. Some of it doesn't. And, yeah. yeah. So anyway, I think it's it's kind of interesting because it's a very specific. It is a feast, mm. but it's one which now we're not told. Like you know, they lay the food out. Obviously, the gods don't actually eat it. What happens to the food? Like we are told that kind of detail right. as you would imagine so i don't know but it unlike normal sacrifices where the blood hmm. pours on the altar or whatever and then everybody's very open about the fact that everyone then eats the food right. themselves that's not what happens in the selecti sternium so whatever it does happen to that food is a little more complicated mm -hmm. it's not a sharing in the food right by the communal group anyway so i just thought that was kind of interesting and in particular that idea of the lactisternium and the pulvinar, the couch, mm. is mentioned in a particular poem that I will speak about at any time if given the slightest opportunity to do so. Uh, I think I'd like to give you that opportunity right now. So this is an Ovid poem that you're talking no, about. No, no, no. Not this, an is Ovid Horace. Poem. Oh, this, this is Horace. This is Horace. Always Horace. Right, right, right. Horace, of course. A Horace, Horus, of, of course. course. Yes. <laughs> This is the Cleopatra poem, the Cleopatra right, okay. Ode. So it's book 137 of Horace's Odes. And it's the poem that celebrates the victory over Cleopatra at Actium. Right. And it starts with, very famously, Nunc est bibendum. Now it is time to drink. Right. And then... I'm often troubled by how to... How translate, to translate that, that into uh, an idiomatic way in English. I mean, very literally it is, now it is to be drunk. Mm -hmm. Now one must drink, mm -hmm. I think. Now one must drink. It's normally translated as, now it's time to drink. Okay. And I think that's a good way to do it. But I'll just read the very first part of it in Latin. Okay. Nunc es bibendum, nunc pede libero pulsanda telus, nunc salieribus ornare Pulvinar deorum tempus erat dapibus sodales. Now it is time to drink. Now, with freed foot, the earth must be struck. Now it is time to decorate the couches of the gods with Salian feasts. That's Salian. Don't worry about what that means, but it's a reference to a place. Friends. Now it is time to do this, friends. And then he goes on to say that's because up till now we couldn't have feasting because we were worried about Cleopatra, mm -hmm. the, the mad queen coming and destroying the capital. But now that she's been driven to suicide, we're fine. And everything's it's time for a celebration. So this is talking about a festival of celebration, a Thanksgiving festival. Right. right. But he specifically mentions now you must put feasts on the couches of the gods. Right. So that's my mm -hmm. tenuous connection to the lectisternium. Right. But I mean, it is. It's now it's time to drink. Now it's time to eat. And now it's time to feed the gods. Right. This is this is what you do when you're celebrating a great triumph. Remember that the lectisternum is connected to triumphs. Hmm. And so that is one of, you know, the, the ritual of the triumph because Augustus, Octavian as he was then, did celebrate a triple triumph at the end of the sort of civil war. And one of the triumphs was over Egypt. Right. So there's a connection there to that. And also the sort of understood connection to using the lectisternium in times of great crisis. Mm -hmm. He di didn't do it during crisis, but it's kind of a reaction to that crisis. But the, that connection of feasting. Right to a religious ritual is really what I want to point out. It's a really good poem. I'm not going to read it all to you, but it's a really good poem and everybody <laughs> should read it and then think about it. And there's lots and lots and lots to think about and about how Cleopatra is portrayed, but that's beside the point for the moment. <laughs> but I know that the nunc est bibendum, now it's time to drink, has become a phrase, yes, right? It's, it's, it's a, a thing. It's a phrase that gets quoted yeah, all, all the time. time. And I know that there's a particular poem that gets written with the same opening. Yeah, it, it inspired a bit of medieval doggerel. <laughs> and I am going to read the whole poem because the sound of it is really Crucial yeah, even here. if even if you don't really know what it means. So nunc es bibendum means that now it's time to drink. Yeah. And 
what you then have is a whole bunch of datives for now it's time to drink for this person and this person and this person and this person, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. so if you know that, you can probably kind of catch mm -hmm. some of it as you go. Well, I'm also going to read a translation of it afterwards. Mm -hmm. As I was, you know, kind of digging through my files to, to find the text of the poem, I uncovered the fact that we had written a translation of this mm -hmm. for a Christmas card. For a Christmas card, which is in verse and rhyming. Yeah, because we're really very clever. <laughs> we obviously spent some time on this back in the day when we used to write our own Christmas cards. <laughs> for years, our Christmas cards were translations of Latin poetry. Mm -hmm. I want you all to sit with that for a moment yeah. and realize that this is what we sent out to the people. This is before we had children, right? So we didn't have like pictures of kids yes. to put on our Christmas cards. Well. A little bit of background to this. So, you know, in, in a lot of medieval Latin secular songs and poems and so forth, they often contain sort of parodies of religious stuff, of ecclesiastical hymns or whatever. So this drinking song begins with, you know, it's got this classical reference to Horace in the title, but the sort of the beginning of the poem proper begins with the first line of a sixth century hymn for the morning office, Iam Lucas Orto Cedera. Now is the rising of the, the light is rising. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the fifth stanza is a parody of the last line of the Athanasian Creed. There's it's a lot of religious stuff. stuff yeah. And just a little other point, classical Latin poetry did not rhyme. Yeah. That was not a thing. Rhyming was just not in Greek or Latin poetry. It did not rhyme. But in the Middle Ages, at some point, and I don't know when it is, like 4th, 5th century, something like that, they start to rhyme. Though not always. No, no, no not yeah. always. But it starts to be a thing that does that happen. You could do. You, and this one definitely Especially rhymes. in sort of popular Yeah, kind yeah. Of and I mean, for all we know, stuff. other stuff rhymed in Latin, but none of the written hmm. stuff we have rhymed. So just, it's an interesting little change. Yeah. And not only does it rhyme, these are short lines. So They're it's... very like doggerly rhyming. Yeah. yeah. It's, yeah. So I will read it first in Latin, and then I will read our translation. Nunc est bibendum. Yam lucis orto sidera statim oportet bibera. Bibamus nunc gregie et rebibamus hodie. Okay, let me just intercede. Bibamus, let us drink. Yes. You're going to hear that again and again. So yeah. Bibamus is let us drink. And rebibamus. Again. Let us drink again. Let's re-drink. <laughs> yeah. Quicumque volt esse frater. Bibat semel bis ter quater. Bibat semel et secundo. Donat nihil sit in fundo. Bibat ille, bibat illa, bibat servus et anquila. Bibat hera, bibat herus, ad bibendum nemo serus. Potatioribus pro cunctis, pro captivis et defunctis, pro imperatore et papa, bibo winum sine aqua. Haec est fides potatica, sociorum spes unica. Qui bene non potaverit, salvus esse non poterit. Longissima potatio, sit nobis salutatio, et durat ista ratio per infinita saecula. Amen. <laughs> Amen. So here's our, our translation of this. It's time to drink. Now that the star of light has risen, we must at once begin our drinking. Let us now drink with might and main, and every day we'll drink again. If you want to be a brother, have a drink, two drinks, another. Have one more and drain your mug until there's none left in the jug. Drink up one and drink up all. Master, mistress, servants hall. Drink up man and his mate. Drink up now and don't be late. Here's to drinkers far and near, and to those no longer here. To the king and pope I'll clink, and that's not water in my drink. Here's the faith of the drinking man, the only hope of our loyal band. Unless he is skilled in potation, no man shall ever reach salvation. Every time there is a meeting, drink deep and let that be our greeting. And may it be that in this way, we live forever and a day. Amen. Amen.
wow, we had time to do good good work. <laughs> That's a good translation. <laughs> a good translation. I quite like that. Yeah. <laughs> There's not just the the parodies you talked about, the uh, drinking for those no longer with us and stuff. Mm. It's part of the is part of the prayer for the the dead and for the Pope, you, you there's a, a right. part of the mass that's also right. where you pray for the King and you pray for the Pope and you yeah. pray for that. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a whole bunch of little bits of parody in there. Yeah. yeah. Right. <laughs> so there's our wish to you yeah, for yeah. this holiday season. <laughs> that's our Christmas card to you. <laughs> so, you know, as we said, this, this line from Horace is, became yeah. very popular and a lot of people mm-hmm. quoted it and mm-hmm. picked it up and did various things with it. And one of the more unexpected <laughs> uses of this line... I've just remembered what this is about. <laughs> so the word bibendum from this from this line was used to refer to what is commonly referred to in English as the Michelin Man... The the sort of official mascot of the Michelin Tire Company. Mm-hmm. He has a name, and it is Bibendum. <laughs> it's so weird. This mascot was first introduced at the Lyon exhibition in 1894. And if you are a longtime listener of ours, you will know I have this fascination with World, world Fairs. Fairs. Yeah. <laughs> so the Michelin brothers had a stand at this, and they... they Kind of use this. So the, the Bibendum is one of the world's oldest trademarks, apparently. And they had this as a slogan, Nunc es Bibendum, which they took from, from Horace. While attending this Universal and Colonial Exposition in Lyon in 1894, Edouard and André Michelin noticed a stack of tires that suggested to Edouard the figure of a man without arms. Mm-hmm. And so four years later, André met a French cartoonist, Marius Ion, who is popularly known as O'Gallop. Okay. So he showed him a rejected image that he had actually originally created for a Munich brewery, for a beer company, and which was a, a large regal figure holding a huge glass of beer and quoting the, the phrase, no guess bibendum initially suggested replacing the man with a figure made from tires. Of course. This, because because he saw this, this pile of tires and yeah, he thought, oh, yeah. looks like a man without arms. Okay. So thus, O'Gallop transformed the earlier image into the Michelin symbol. Today, Bibendum is, you know, one of the most recognized mascots, trademarks around the world. And what is it he drinks? Well, I'll get to that. <laughs> so in the 1898 poster of this trademark, this mascot mm-hmm. figure, mm-hmm. it showed him offering offering the toast, Nunc es Bibendum, mm-hmm. to his scrawny competitors, the bad tire, the bad tire companies, <laughs> with a glass full of road hazards. Things that might you know hurt your tire, like, I don't know, broken glass and rocks and whatever. A glass full of road hazards. Yes, a glass full of road road hazards. With the title and tag, c'est-à-dire, à votre santé, le pneu Michelin voit l'obstacle. So that is to say, here's to your health, the Michelin tire drinks up obstacles. <laughs> so weird. <laughs> Such a weird place to go with that. Yeah. And then the fact that the Michelin becomes the Michelin guide to restaurants eventually, yes. right? Like so, there's that which, the it, which is not what that's in reference to no. because that doesn't happen until later. Yeah, yeah. But then you end up with the Michelin guide to restaurants, which is about fine dining, fine dining and, and yeah. feasting. Yeah, yep. it's so weird. <laughs> wow. So yeah, the the obvious the implication is there that uh, the Michelin tires will easily drink up those road hazards but you know the competitors won't yeah so from 1912 onwards the tires became black in color because carbon was added as a preservative and strengthener to the basic kind of rubber Mm -hmm. that they were made out of tires used to be a different color which is why the michelin man is white right because tires used to be white right Weird. So they used to be sort of this gray, white, or light and translucent 
beige color until that carbon was added to make to them make stronger. them tougher or whatever. Right. And so apparently bibendum was briefly redrawn as black in color mm -hmm. but they very quickly changed him back citing sort of you know printing and aesthetic issues for the change and denying that there was any racial concerns <laughs> so it's good knows? so it was good when you have to deny that there are racial yes. concerns yes well a lot of people believed it was i guess so yeah, yeah. i know that's why I, yeah <laughs> But that's why it's a bunch of white tires. The guy made out a bunch of white yeah, tires. Yeah, that's true. Now. I don't think I'd ever even thought about it. I have in my head a weird conflation between the Michelin Man and the Stay Puft Marshmallow Man <laughs> of Ghostbusters. In my head, they're kind of the same person. They are kind of, yeah. Marketing. So, creation. yeah. Well, anyway. So, yeah. So, yeah. So, tires used to be white. Weird. <laughs> and drank up road obstacles. And so this... This mascot has become so ingrained in the popular consciousness that it is, it's become a word that is in the OED, the Michelin Man, mm -hmm. to refer to something not directly related to tires. So as the OED defines it, the name of the plump tire man has entered the language to describe someone obese or wearing comically bulky clothing, e.g., how can I wrap up warm without looking like the Michelin man? And right. that's the sense that I think of it in is being yeah, at wintertime being bundled up. up right? yeah, so this bring us back true. to Christmas. <laughs> Tangentially, yeah, sure. <laughs> Good try. <laughs> and so, yeah, and they go on to say the Michelin man, noun, a cartoon character whose body and limbs are composed of layers of pneumatic tires, mm -hmm. giving a rotund, rigid appearance, hence elusively and in similes, with a reference to a person resembling a Michelin man in some way, as wearing heavy, heavily padded clothing, be, being overweight, etc. Mm -hmm. And so Michelin man itself, they, the first citation they have is in 1954, in the observer, the Michelin man, whose name is Bibendum, is evocative of such delights as foreign travel, luscious food, and the best maps in the world. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> and in 1972, in The Guardian, the spirit of the French Michelin man is quietly pacing the British byways. Michelin will bring out their first guide to British hotels and restaurants in March 1974. Hmm. And in 1991, Sports Illustrated, Bonilla legged out 44 doubles this year, despite a body that puts most people in mind of the Michelin Man. There's the obese <laughs> reference. But I, honestly, yeah. I, I think of it as the being bundled up. Yeah, bundled up. That's, yeah, yeah, wearing, I, wearing yeah. lots of layers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that brings us back to fine French style dining, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Always looking for that circular narrative, aren't you? <laughs> and so I guess as a final thing, I will, this is maybe, you know, dooming ourselves, but I will point out that I am currently working on this year's Christmas video. <laughs> yeah. You know, you remember how we talked about the magic video back before Halloween? Not the magic video, the no, monster video. Monster video, sorry. Yeah. And then you failed, failed well to... we, we we haven't done the monster video and we, there'll be a monster video next halloween yes we put it on hiatus until next halloween so now you're going to talk about the video that we're supposed to get out before christmas yes okay which is about calendar <laughs> and it will pick up on a lot of the points that a we've lot of the points yeah, that yeah. we've we've talked about today you know month names and day names but but also you know kind of seasonal stuff and mm -hmm. And go into more detail about that. Yeah. Yes. So watch out for, for that, that and soon. <laughs> hopefully it'll be really soon. Right, Mark? I mean, I'm actually animating it now. Yeah, so. you are. So like at this point, I think it's actually going to happen. Yeah. I hope so. All right. Well, on that hopeful note, <laughs> this is our last episode before the new year. Mm -hmm. So to everybody who's celebrating any kind of turn of the year, change of the seasons over the next month or so. May there be lightness and brightness in that change for you. Mm -hmm. Because these are dark times, seasonally and existentially. Um, and, we, and, you know, climatically. Yeah, so we need all the lightness we can get, I think. And we'll be back in January with 
more things. We have a whole bunch of more interviews we want to do with more people. Mm -hmm. But we'll also try to get maybe a couple of actual just themed chats, too. You never know. Stranger things have happened. <laughs> All right. Happy holidays. No guest be bend them. <laughs> bye, bye For more information on this podcast, check out our website, www.alliterative.net, where you can find links to the videos, blog posts, sources, and credits, and all our contact info. And please check out our Patreon, where you can pledge to support this show and our video project. You can go directly to the videos at youtube.com slash alliterative. Our email is on the website, but the easiest way to get in touch with us is Twitter. I'm at Avensara, A-V-E-N-S-A-R-A-H. And I'm at Alliterative. To keep up with the podcast, subscribe on your favorite podcast app or to the feed on the website. And if you've enjoyed it, consider leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. It helps us a lot. We'll be back soon with more musings about the connections around us. Thanks for listening. Bye.